All right. One more time, let's look at Genesis. And we, uh, again, if you would, turn with me to chapter 1. And I promise you, I, I'll leave Genesis alone after this. <laughs> it's kind of been on my mind lately. But uh, just having finished the last section, which of course covers the life of Joseph, I've been kind of inclined to focus upon the power that he came to occupy. And uh, perhaps he was one of the most powerful uh, people in history. Certainly in his time he was. And Joseph, however, uses his God-given power in a way that furnishes a lot of valuable lessons for us. And I want to share just a couple of those with us. The thing that really impresses me about Joseph is the, the position that he occupied and the power that he held. He mainly used all of that to be a blessing to other people and not uh, uh, for his own selfish interests. And so I want to share with you uh, some things to set the, the table for his exemplary leadership and, and use of power. I, I've had you turn to chapter 1. And a very familiar verse, verse 28, it's the creation uh, in a capsule of uh, human beings, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish, or spread out all over the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Joseph is, and this is the basis for it, is a manager. God made human beings in his own image. We read that in verse 26, that God created human beings to be his image bearers. And having created humans in his own image, he created them to be in control. Notice the wording there in verse 28. God put human beings on this earth to subdue it and to have dominion over it. In other words, created in the image of God, we are made to be his representative rulers on this earth. So human power is linked to a stewardship for God. We are managers, you might say. God makes mankind the managers of planet Earth. We're to subdue it and uh, bring it into dominion. And this is the basis for the rulership of Joseph. He, a man, Created by God for God's purpose, he was a manager in the land of Egypt, and as a result, really, was a manager over other nations that by default were coming to Egypt for their supplies during that famine, that drought, and that blight that caused the famine. That's the basis for power, human power. We're managers. We're just stewards. We don't own it. But we're to take care of it. And we're to take care of it for God. And if we are managers, if we are stewards, then of what belongs to God, we need to be careful about how we, how we manage, right? How we manage things if it really belongs to God. It's not ours. We don't want to vandalize it. And we, don't, uh, we want to handle it rightly. So we're a manager. But here's the danger. In chapter 3, which we've already looked at uh, briefly this morning, and in verses 6 and 7, where the serpent comes to Eve, and it says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, see the, the build-up, the progressive steps, right, to sin, the yielding to sin, the temptation. It says... She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He didn't have to, but he did. 
Verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Mankind created in the image of God by God to be a manager. But here's the danger. The manager has fallen. We're fallen. Power from God has been put into the hands of fallen creatures. Did you know that one of the reasons why we have three branches of government in the United States of America is because our founding fathers realized this fundamental truth of mankind is that we are fallen creatures. And so they separated the three branches. He, they separated the powers so that they would function as a check and balance upon each other to keep each other honest, so to speak, and from abusing power. And of course, we're seeing all of that being attacked today. Amen. Well, that's not my message. That's just an illustration that we're manager, but here's the danger. We're fallen, and our founding fathers realized that. Like anything that, uh, that people are given as a gift by God, it can either be used properly or it can be abused. Someone said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There was a, a famous Italian politician. His name was Machiavelli. And Machiavelli, his name is associated with the evil use of power. He was a man who viewed uh, politics as an opportunity to gain power over others by godless scheming and self-interest. And uh, that's called Machiavellian, Machiavellian power. That's the danger. The manager is fallen. Uh, we're sinners. And you know what? You don't have to be a tyrant to abuse your power. You can be a manipulating spouse, or you can be a whining, crying child, and, uh, and you can manipulate people in that way. But I want to get to Joseph, because a manager, a danger, but here we have really an exemplar of what power and the position of power really ought to look like in a believing life. He's a man that is in that position, first of all, because he's God appointed. He didn't take the position on himself. God appointed him to that position where we find him, and it really begins in chapter 41 and through the end of chapter 50, where he rises to that, that supreme position of uh, the governor of Egypt, the vizier of Egypt, the prime minister, whatever you want to call him uh, in that day. This was a God-appointed position that God had shaped him for. And what we have, I believe, in the life of Joseph is really a, what I would call a blueprint for powerful leadership. He excellently uses his power, and uh, it is the result of several things. And this is really the bulk of my message. So if you haven't heard anything yet, uh, tune in now, okay? Uh, if you're watching online, put your lunch down. And uh, listen up. Four things that I want to share with you that I think are so important. And really, this is the basic reason why this man was such a powerful person. Truly powerful people understand these truths. Number one, he was a man that was yielded. A man that was yielded. That is, he chose, and it's a choice. He chose to place himself under God. He chose to place himself in submission to God. You remember in chapter 50, after dad dies and the boys are scared that now Joseph's going to get even. God, uh, dad isn't there to be the mediator and the buffer between us and Joseph. And they come to him and said, now remember, before dad died, he said blah, blah. And Joseph weeps. Humble man. 
And he says to them something to this effect. Am I in the place of God? And the implication is simply, I have not usurped God's place and I don't intend to. I have deliberately chosen to place myself under God, to submit to God, because I recognize and I believe that God is sovereignly in control over all circumstances, over all people, over everything he permits to touch our lives. Yielded. That makes for a powerful person. You would think just the opposite. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? If you give in, if you yield, if you submit, you're weak. No. If you submit to God, if you yield yourself to Him, you are setting yourself up to be powerfully used by God. To be a powerful influencer and a powerful impactor of people and a powerful leader of people. And Joseph is a perfect example of that. Yielded. Number two, he is a man that forgave. A man that forgave. And again, I'm going to, you're going to hear this word again and again in every single instance. This man chose to forgive. It's a choice. Just as it's a choice to submit to God, it's a personal choice to forgive. He chose to, and, uh, to forgive his brothers. He refused to become bitter against them or vengeful uh, over the injustice that he suffered at their hands. Why? Because Joseph believed that God uses all in order to accomplish his purpose in the world. And the way that he accomplishes his purpose in the world is through people, is through us, specifically his people, God's people. And so he forgave because he realized that if God allowed that in my life, then God somehow intends to use that to accomplish his purpose in this world, and I'm going to cooperate with God's purpose. Now, he confronted their evil, right? Clearly, he, conf he, didn't, he wasn't in denial. He was very honest and open with them, and he confronted their evil, but he released them. He set them free. He let it go because he recognizes overarching truth that God allowed that in his life. Ye meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God is accomplishing his purpose in the world through people, good or bad. Third thing, and that is, he was a man that knew that he was endowed, that the, he had this reality that the wisdom and the ability that he had was nothing less than a gift from God. That it wasn't something that he, uh, that, that he uh, won himself or that he, uh, he, he developed uh, himself. He realized that he was endowed with this wisdom, with this ability from God himself and uh, that he had nothing to do with it whatsoever except to cooperate with what God's plan was for his life. And uh, he was simply the recipient of God's blessing. And that his position that he had been exalted to was a God-given gift to simply further the plan of God in the world. And so, in being endowed with his wisdom and, and ability and giftedness, he simply chose to depend upon God and not on himself. People that realize that they have nothing that they haven't received are people that are God-dependent people. They don't trust their flesh. They don't trust their innate ability. They look to God for it. And fourthly and finally, he was a man that was a powerful person because he served. And again, that was a choice that he made. He viewed his position and his power as a means to serve others to fulfill God's plan. Use the wisdom, use the energy that God gave him to bless other people's lives. 
not to further empower or enrich himself. Now, all of this, of course, pertains to us. While none of us in this room will likely ever rise to the height of power that Joseph did, we all have authority in some realm and to some degree. There is a certain amount of power that we have now and that perhaps we will gain as our lives uh, go forward. We have to remember we are merely managers. We have to remember the danger we're fallen managers. We have to remember this exemplar that we have in the life of Joseph, a man who was yielded, a man who forgave, a man who was endowed by God. He realized it was him, it was God and not him, and a man who served. That was what his life was about. Most of us here, I think, uh, have heard of D.L. Moody. He was the most famous evangelist in his day, not only in America, but also in Europe. And that was back in the mid to late 1800s. Moody, after he kind of retired from evangelism, he opened and developed a couple of uh, schools in Northfield, Massachusetts, where he was from. And uh, he would also have annual Bible conferences there. And there would be people from all over the world, as well as America, that would travel for these Bible conferences. He had big name speakers uh, that uh, you and I would uh, have heard of. But um, one time there was a large group of European pastors that came to one of Moody's Northfield Bible conferences, as they were called, uh, in the 1800s. And following the European custom at that time, each of the guests at night put their shoes outside the door of his room to be cleaned by the hall servants overnight. Little did they know there was no such custom in the United States of America. That night, Moody happened to be walking in the dormitory halls where these men were housed and he saw all these shoes, and he re recognized what was happened, and so uh, what had happened, he determined not to embarrass <coughs> his brothers, so he, he mentioned the need to some of the ministerial students that were around the campus, but uh, none of them really wanted the job. They didn't say anything, or they gave some pious excuse. So Moody returned himself that night to the dormitory and he gathered up all the shoes and he took them secretly really to his own room where he was alone and here's this world famous evangelist and he's polishing the shoes of all of these European pastors and they had no idea what was going on. The only way this was found out was he had an unexpected uh, uh, visit by a personal friend of his who caught him doing it and who revealed the secret to some others. And when the foreign visitors opened their doors, of course, the next morning, there their shoes were all shined. And they never knew who did it. Because Moody didn't tell anyone, but his friend told a few people. And so during the rest of the conference, uh, different men would volunteer to shine the shoes in secret. D.L. Moody, he was a man with a genuine, humble heart. And I think that that was the basis of his powerful ministry. Joe's or Joseph's willingness to suffer and to serve others was the secret to his powerful position. And I think that that is the secret to being used by God in a powerful way. I think it's illustrated in the life of Moody, but I think it's best illustrated in the life of Joseph powerful people. They may or may not be powerful in the eyes of the world, right? They may not be the governor of a land, but they're powerful in the eyes of God. If they follow this exemplar, Joseph, who was a man that God molded and used, and we're still talking about, reading about him and talking about him today, as such an example of that. 
Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you will just take these simple thoughts and cause them to ring true and uh, deep in our mind, in our heart. And I pray that uh, we would not seek position or power or authority so that we can be anything of ourselves, but rather that we might be a blessing to others as Joseph was to Egypt and to other countries, his own family. Father, we pray that we would be a people that are yielded to you, a people that are submitted to the God that, uh, that uh, they love and serve, a people that would recognize the fact that we are what we are by your grace and by your grace alone. We have nothing in and of ourselves to glory in. Our, if we glory, we glory not in might nor in, uh, in wisdom of our own, but we glory in the Lord. And with that, Lord, uh, I pray that we would uh, we'd be a people that would evidence the power of their God in our daily life as well as in uh, any ministry that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.